Welcome to On Texas Football. It's time for the Friday afternoon live stream. I'm Bobby Burton, joined by CJ Vogel uh, and Rod Babers. Guys, uh, Sark, the title of this uh, this show is Sark's on a Heater, uh, because he is right now. The Longhorns can't get off of one, it seems like. Uh, it's been about, what, six months where we felt this way? Uh, other than, really, uh, the loss to Oklahoma um, and maybe the loss to Washington in some ways. I mean, has Texas ever gone through six months of feel good like this since 2006? Because I can't remember it. Uh, Rod, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to start with you because you and I are old enough to go back that far. <laughs> I mean, do you, can, you, can you remember a time, seriously, in the, where there's been a six to nine month period where it's really been nothing but good news for the Longhorns? And if you even go back further, you can add in Arch Manning's commitment, uh, you know, not our 12 months ago or whatever, you know, however you want to position that. I mean, it's just been one thing after another for going on a year now for the Longhorns. Uh, yeah, you haven't because I don't know if we've ever had the college football calendar look like it, it looks right now with the transfer portal and the transfer portal windows and players being able to have a 30 day window for the transfer portal. If their coach vacates or if there's a head coach in vacancy. So because of the changing landscape of college sports and Texas right now seem to be uh, a, a huge beneficiary right, of that vastly uh, quickly changing landscape. I don't know if you can say there's ever been a time where there's this much positive buzz you know, after a season, the program, after two, after you win a national title, there's a lot of buzz, of course. Um, but I mean, you aren't necessarily acquiring people via the transfer portal like this because it, it wasn't possible. Um, so I think because now we're living in a new world, a new era of college football. Yeah, it does seem like there's a lot of buzz there's a lot of news and all of it. Most of it, uh, you know, damn near all of it seems to be really positive for the low ones. Yeah. I mean, here's my take. You know, you mentioned that about the, 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 the uh, national championship season. And really after the, the Rose bowl game where they beat Michigan. Right. Yeah. And then that led into that next year, that was two years of just craziness. Bliss. Um, <laughs> I, I literally can't remember a consistency other than this in the past 15 years that we've seen uh, from the Texas football program. And uh, so when we say Sark's on a heater, uh, we mean it. That's a term, by the way, that Sark himself, uh, kind of coined. He didn't say sorry. He didn't use the term Sark. He just tweeted on a heater. Uh, yes. And that's where Texas is. Uh, CJ, your thoughts on this, uh, get your feedback. You're a little bit younger than Rod and I. So this, this, this is new territory for you a little bit as a Texas fan and a Texas grad. It certainly is. I mean, I remember, uh, you know, from high school to college days, dating back to basically the beginning, or I guess the conclusion of the Mac Brown era, you know, it was never smooth sailing. There was always something. Texas couldn't piece together anything on the field that was worth what, you know, as, as celebratory as we're seeing right now. Obviously, the Sugar Bowl uh, win over Georgia was exciting. You thought you had the pieces in place to make the jump into a national uh, contending team. Unfortunately, that wasn't the case. But, you know, you saw spurts of recruiting success. You saw spurts of on-field success. It was never the two together, and it was never – sustained for you know a six to nine to maybe even a full year of what we're seeing right now for the Texas football program so it's I mean it's certainly exciting especially when you consider the move to 2024 is you know you're you're going into the SEC you have a lot going for you right now the portal momentum is certainly something that is grabbing national headlines uh you're sending a lot of guys to the NFL as well oh and you're also finishing or coming off a season in which you finished top three in, in in college football. So a lot of success, a lot of momentum. And it's like you said, Sark's on a he heater. The ball is rolling and it's getting big and big as it, as it rolls down the hill. Yeah. Snowball is rolling, but that's, that's the way to, that's the way we want it to be. And that's the way it needs to be, in my opinion, uh, it, it, for the Longhorns. Hey, Rod, uh, something else happened this week. Uh, Dwayne Aquina, a uh, guy that you and I both know pretty well. You've yeah. you worked, you you worked for him. You played for him yeah, no doubt. Uh, at Texas. Uh, he came out uh, via social media and said he is staying at Arizona. Uh, loves both programs, Texas and uh, Arizona, uh, but staying at Arizona. Uh, it's uh, ostensibly for an on-field role. Texas yeah. was going to be for an off-field role. Uh, we understand that. That's the difference between making 100 to 200 grand 
and making 400 to 600 grand. Um, you know, everybody in the line goes, yes, I love the University of Texas, but the 500 grand job sounds like I need to go do it. <laughs> and, you know, this is the thing that I, I think people don't appreciate about Coach Akina. He loves to coach, man. Yeah, That's what he feels like he was born to do. It's not necessarily the off-field. And not that he's older. He's 67 years old. But, man, getting that guy on a football field, he's one of those guys that he can be 67 and still have a, a, a pep in his step when he gets on the field, right? Yeah, I mean, he's one of those guys where, of course, he would have been a great asset for anybody, you know, in the analyst role. That's advanced scouting, self-scouting. Uh, but you don't get a chance to build those relationships in recruiting, which is what he loves to do. Um, and he's about those connections with the players. Uh, he's a teacher. So he wants to, you know, actually, in a, in a sense, teach every player individually, um, see exactly what their strengths, weaknesses are, what they need from him as a coach uh, and as a teacher and provide whatever is needed for those guys to help them be the best version of themselves. He's, and he can't do that as an analyst. And he had that experience with Arizona and realized, you know, if he wanted a, re wanted a reduced role, he could have taken a reduced role. Uh, he doesn't want that. Now, even at 67, Trust me, his energy level is that of a 47-year-old person. I mean, really he's, got is. A, he's got a really high energy level. He always has, and he's got a he's got an amazing spirit. I mean, his his spirit is something that it leaves an impression on you when you're around uh when you're around Coach Akina. Everybody knows that everybody's talking about that. And that's what makes him great at coaching. That's what makes him great in recruiting. Um, so really you are taking away a lot of the elements that make him unique and special when you just say put him in an analyst role. Uh, and he knows that too. And I, I got a feeling like sit, just sitting in that film room, not being itching to to go talk to players and to go teach and coach them. Um, I, I got I got a feeling that probably it, it, for for a guy like Coach Akina, that was probably hard for him to stomach last season um, and hard to deal with because he really he really is about the connections, really is about relationships. So I get it. And yes, like you said, the straight cash homie, uh, <laughs> they uh, they get offered more money. That always helps. You got to do what's best for your family. Uh, he's got a growing family. Family continues to grow for Coach Akina. So I'm happy for him, man. I, I I actually thought him in an analyst role, man, that is a hell of a bargain. That's one of the best bargains in college football. You got him as an analyst. Him now being a coach on the field, uh, once again, he'll prove to be a great coach. He always has been. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, uh, I, I feel like uh, we're looking at a, a time where, uh, look, Coach Akina is going to make up his own mind, do his own thing. Uh, and I, I wish him nothing but the best. I really do. Uh, mm -hmm. Just a great, great guy and someone I think we can all uh, root for wherever he's at. Right. Exactly. I mean, yep. I don't think he would take a job at OU. I'll, I'll just put it that way. And he turned down <laughs> a job at AM. People don't realize that. Uh, he turned down a job from Jimbo Fisher because uh, he just couldn't go to AM back in the day. Hey, good uh, for him. I, and it would have been a lot of money. And it would have been a lot of money. Mm -hmm. um, hey, Rod, it, uh, I, it, CJ and I talked yesterday subsequent to Amari Nyblack's commitment to the University of Texas, uh, the tight end uh, out of the transfer portal via the University of Alabama. Uh, I wanted to get your uh, take on that situation and uh, what he means to this Texas offense. Uh, CJ and I have talked about the speed component of what he brings. Uh, your thoughts on, on Nyblack and what he brings to the table. Yeah, it's interesting. How, how, how many other tight ends were they interested in? Were they interested in anybody? Just the Stanford kid, the Uris? They were, they, yeah, so they liked the Stanford kid one. Yeah. That was uh, one that they definitely liked, Ben Uro, Urosik, yeah. uh out of Stanford. They also like Holden Stays, okay. tight end that caught like 16 balls for Notre Dame this past year, who's originally mm -hmm. from Atlanta. Uh, he signed with Tennessee. Really, they only showed much love to those three. Okay. Stays, they said they were going to wait on. I think when Eurosic uh, went into the portal, they probably liked Eurosic better. And then when Nyblack went in, I think all bets were off because Sark saw that deer yeah. running down the the side. Yeah. He saw that. He saw what he saw against him in his yeah. in his dreams of throwing to the tight end. You okay, know, that 39, yeah. thirty nine yard touchdown that he had. Yeah, that's what I thought because um, you know a guy like uh, Eurosic, right? He, I think he's got um, a lot more skins on the wall. Um, in yep. terms of his productivity. And we talked about how Sark was, he was bringing in productivity, proving commodities via the transfer portal. And I do think he's veered a little bit off of that, just a little bit um, for Nye Black and maybe for um, uh, Blackshire. I think he did a little bit and I, for really specific reasons. I think the reason is because he, 
basically Nye Black can bring something to the table that you don't have on your roster right now. Yeah. You don't have a type, what you lost in JT Sanders, you lost a lot, but you lost the ability to hunt matchups with that tight end. You can do it with Gunnar Helm, and Gunnar Helm is, is capable and, and he's consistent and gotten a lot, got a lot better last season, but he's not going to guarantee you a matchup advantage um, when you scheme him up. Uh, he, I'm sure he'll run consistent routes, but he's not a matchup nightmare and not a matchup disadvantage necessarily uh, for a defender. Uh, I think I think if you, you got a guy like Night Black, depending on who he's matched up against, a linebacker, some of those uh, slower safeties. I mean, this is a guy that can be uh, really a, a, a interesting chess piece for Sark. Now he's pass for he's a pass first tight end. He's not the kind of guy that's going to be an elite blocker for you. And I think that's also very telling getting, getting back to the speed component, the speed element of this acquisition cycle that CJ has talked about. And that we've talked about, it seems like Sark, this is all intentional now that he wants to be able to blitz opponents with speed. And he wants to put the fear of God and defensive coordinators having to defend all that speed. And and what that's going to open up offensively for him. There's no crowd. It, it definitely seems intentional. Whether you're talking about the recruiting classes, or whether you're talking about the transfer portal guys they're bringing in, um, that seems to be a common trait. Um, they they want to be the fastest, if not one of the fastest offenses in the country. Even after losing X Man and Keelan Robinson, it seems like Sark now he's building this offense, and he can strategically pick all the pieces, uh, speed and explosive agility. Uh, it seemed to be those common opponents, uh, common components in the offense. Is it just me? Uh, and, and CJ, I want to grab you on this. The, the, I think that Sark has gone this direction because he's seen it before with guys like Waddle and Jalen uh, Waddle, Henry Ruggs, um, and um, uh, Dante Smith, yeah. right? Those three guys are, are super fast. Now, Jerry Judy is fast. But he's more that four four five guy. The other guys are four four and below, right? Um, it, part of it seems to me that late in the year, when he got Keelan Robinson more touches, and he got Jaden Blue more touches, and they had that speed component, it felt like he started to see his offense open up a little bit more. You think that influenced him at all, or is it really more? Is it something different? Because I, I felt there's like a little thing changed starting maybe with the, the TCU game, maybe a little bit where they found some guys in space and started pushing it a little bit more. And then that kind of directed what he did in the, the transfer portal. Because, look, there were other receivers that had more skins on the wall than uh, Silas Bolden. I mean, they, they could have had a guy that had 70-something something something catches at Liberty. Yeah right? As opposed to Silas Bolden or 50, whatever it is. My point being that did, did he start taking speed and saying, okay, that's where I want to take this thing as opposed to, you know, we could be more like we just were with that pro style where we have the one outside speed guy, the one, one-on-one -on -one mismatch guy with Worthy and Mitchell, and then the slot guy that's dependable. It seems like he's kind of just said, eh, let's go. You know, let, let's go turbo. You know, that that feels to me, and I think it I think that Jaden Blue was a piece of that mm -hmm. because he started getting that guy out in space and just running by people. It's not like Jaden Blue necessarily made anybody miss. He just ran by him. I mean, and, and I know he's a running back, but it it that bleeds into your offense. Um, it's what Devin A. Chain gives to Miami. In, in the pros, you know, CJ, you have any thoughts there? Yeah, I, I, I certainly think, unfortunately, the injury to Jonathan Brooks kind of forced his hand to getting these guys back on the field. You know, you talk about Jaden Blue's speed, the big playability of Keelan Robinson. That was kind of forced onto the field as a result of the absence of Brooks. And to Sark's credit, when you get these type of guys on the field, you you use them in the way that fits their strength. And their strength is getting the ball to them in space, allowing their speed and, and ability to just run by players, as you as you mentioned, Bobby, take you know control of what he does schematically. And I, I think it did kind of you know lead the offense to being 
perhaps a little bit more explosive. I don't think we necessarily saw a drop off in production following Jonathan Brooks's injury, but also the play style in which Texas was able to use their weapons around them changed out of the backfield specifically. Uh, it's one of those things, whether or not it, you know, kind of changed Sarkeesian's approach to the portal or not, we're going to see the similar style approach in 2024 as a result of having such speed at each position on the field now and not necessarily, you know, just one deep ball threat on the, on the outside that can beat you with speed. Uh, only one guy on the outside that can beat you with a big body. It's going to be a lot of speed, a lot of uh, uh, ability to break the top off of a defense from a number of different angles as well as out of the backfield guys that you can get the ball to in space and let them do the work more so than needing a perfect throw down the sideline to hit AD Mitchell for, for whatever gain you're looking for. These guys will be able to cook with the ball after the, after the catch. So I'm, I'm right there with you. I think that's a great uh, train of thought there. Yep. A couple of things. Sark, Sark, Sark's always been obsessed with speed. That's always been an obsession with him, right? We we know that. Uh, him and Al Davis, <laughs> right? They, they bobbed out over their obsession with speed. Sark also loves the Shanahan coaching tree. He, he admittedly talks about how he studies it and he adds different elements from the Shanahan coaching tree. We know that from even following his uh, his time uh, in Atlanta when he used a lot of the, the, the two tailback sets to transition that offense from a 21 personnel offense with Shanahan runs to his own offense. He's admitted to going to, you know, see, visit the Rams so he can study Sean McVay. One of the latest of the Mech Shanahan franchise of coaches is Mike McDaniel. Mike McDaniel is obsessed with speed. It's been a, and it, it's a big component, right? He's all about speed for Tua, and Tua gets the ball out, and it's all about yak after that. Of course, Tyreek Hill probably being the most notable of those speed demons. Um, I wonder if he – well, I don't wonder. I know he's watching Mike McDaniel's offense. I know he's using some of those – uh, concepts because he actually used what they have called the cheat or the cheetah motion, that short motion um, running parallel to line of scrimmage to give them a running start yep. right before the snap. That's a Mike McDaniel, uh, a, a Mike McDaniel concept that he came up with. And Sh everybody in the Shanahan tree has used it from LaFleur to uh, Shanahan to Sean McDaniel. Every, and they admitted like, Oh, we stole it from him. He's great. Um, we know it. We know that, Sark has used that cheat cheat emotion this season. He stole it from one of them, probably just Mike McDaniel. Probably took it right off of that coaching tree. And with that being said, though, they use motion. They use motion more than anybody else in the league. They have gone extreme with it. Sark is actually a lot more moderate than his mo with motion now than he needs to be. He's probably close to 55% of his plays in motion, something like that, 55, 60%. Uh, hell, the Dolphins are probably close to 80%. <laughs> 75 80 percent there's a chance that sark now uses a lot more of those concepts and wants to get his very fast offensive players the ball on the move to increase that yak you're talking about and you do it with a lot more motion and getting the balls to targets that are already in motion and i've tracked targets to motion which is a stat i can give out later on but one of the most successful concepts for Sark, no matter who his quarterback is, no matter who the receivers are, are targets to motion. That is a target to a player that's in motion at the time of the snap or before the snap. Now, he doesn't use it a lot, but I wonder if now he's going to you know, increase it, like uh, exponentially increase the rate of targets to motion, exponentially increase motion, period. Because that's what Mike McDaniel's offense has done more than any other offense in the league. And one thing that Mike McDaniel's offense was really good at was red zone offense. It was actually touchdown percentage in the red zone, one of the top five best in the league early on. I haven't looked at the recent stats of it, but early on they were like the, one of the top five best red zone touchdown percentage uh, teams in the league. What did Texas uh Real suffer at last year. What was one of their weak points last year? It was red zone offense, touchdowns in the red zone specifically. And if you're studying the best offenses in football, which we know Sark does, and we know he steals plays and concepts, he's admitted that, and we know he studies the Shanahan tree, which he's also admitted, then he's definitely studied Mike McDaniel. And I think all that speed could also be something that Sark decided to become an extremist about because of what he's seen with Mike McDaniel. And that means he's going to increase targets to motion that may end up helping him in the red zone too. Yeah. I would love that. I mean, I would love that Rod. I think all of us uh, would to be, to be quite honest. I mean, 
Uh, Texas has to get better in the red zone next year. All right, uh, before we get going, we're going to take some questions from uh, everybody today. We've got uh, not only do we have team news we can talk about, uh, we've got recruiting news. Uh, we'll do just about anything and everything today. Uh, Longhorns host over 100 kids tomorrow uh, for their first junior day of the campaign. Uh, but before we do all that, I want to say thank you to our sponsor. Each and every Friday's live stream brought to you by our friend Andy Ludicky at MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you're looking to start a new gig in the new year, give Andy and his team a call, 404-973-9901. If you want to own your own business and think franchising might be the right way to go, uh, Andy is who you want to start with. He can take you through a process uh, that, that makes sure you understand what you're getting into, which franchises are best for you, given your time and money uh, and commitment uh, to it. Uh, give Andy a call, 404 404- 973-9901 or email him andy at myperfectfranchise.net. Thank you, Andy, for everything uh, you've done for us over the years uh, here at On Texas Football. All right, let's start here, guys. Aaron Hampton, Juan with 499 Super Chat here. Aaron, what happened? Aaron Hampton, what ha- what do you think? He's their king. Bad move by him. Now your thoughts, Bobby. <laughs> Hampton uh, famously opted for Alabama on signing day. CJ, is this a, a scenario where the Longhorns should be concerned? Or is he, is he his time come and gone, given that they went and got uh, uh, Aaron Butler out of, uh, out of uh, Calabasas, California? Yeah, you saw how quickly Texas moved out west to go add another, you know, similar, you know, style wide receiver uh, following his decommitment. It really only took about 48 hours for Texas to get Aaron Butler into the fold. It was unfortunate now for any of those Alabama signees to see what happened with the guy that they had just signed up for to go play. You've you've obviously talked about uh, Julian Sain entering the portal this afternoon or this morning, excuse me. Uh, He was, you know, up in the consideration for number one, number two quarterback in the entire country. He's now looking to find a new home as well as a number of other Alabama players. It's, you know, just kind of unfortunate for someone like Aaron Hampton. You were in a good position to sign with Texas. You found what you thought was a better one to go play for Nick Saban. Nick Saban retires, and now you're kind of stuck in the mud with a lot of other guys right now who had the expectation to go play for the greatest college coach of all time. So, unfortunately, but Texas did find their guy with Aaron Butler, have him in the class. He visited last week. He should enroll uh, in the summer, get on campus, and, and Texas is happy with what they got. Gotcha. Uh, mm-hmm. Hey, uh, so guys, a uh, couple of news th- items. Michael Turner out of North Richland Hills uh, is going to be making his way to Austin this weekend as well. Uh, he is a guy that's long been thought to be leaning to Oklahoma, uh, considered a top 100 player in the country, according to On3. So uh, keep that in mind as well. Some other uh, late news notes uh, happening to junior day this weekend. All right, uh, before we go on, we'll go to this one next. This one from Justin Yarbrough. Appreciate you, Justin. Is there still a possibility Derek Johnson joins the staff as an assistant and any more analysts in play? Um, Hmm. We generally don't hear much about analysts until after they happen. Uh, Dwayne Aquina was just happened to be such a big name. Yeah. Uh, Like we didn't know Payam Sadat uh, last year from Portland State until he showed up on campus as the defensive analyst. Uh, Joe D. Camillus uh, is one of those guys that was a well-known commodity because he had 30 years experience coaching special teams. Um, th- there's just a different level there as far as analyst. As far as Derek Johnson is concerned, Rod, I'm going to let you take that one because it's my understanding that he's welcome on campus anytime he wants to go there, but they went with Johnny Nansen as the linebacker role. I don't know if Derek wants to be – uh, wants to actually be a full-time coach at this point. What are your thoughts? I'm not sure he wants to be a full-time coach either. I know he's in that linebacker room a lot, a lot. Like, he's in there all the time. And so, and they love him around the young guys. And he goes out to the practice fields, and he's right there, you know, coaching up the guys. So, hell, they might just be getting a bargain, maybe getting that good coaching for free. <laughs> They're like, why are we going to pay him? He's up here all the time. But, uh, no, I, I don't think he – I don't think Derek from what – and, I, I, you know, I hang out with Derek all the time and doing the third Longhorns podcast. Shout out to my man, Nick Shuley and the crew. Uh, but Derek, he's always around there because he talks about how he tries to get up there as much as possible. And from what I can gather, I haven't talked to him about this, 
he's he's uh he's enjoying being like a full-time dad for the most part he's got his charity the Derek johnson foundation which he's heavily involved with as well um and so i i don't know if he's ready to be a full-time assistant just yet there that could be a time though and there, there definitely could be a time um but man he's got I want to say Derek's got like four, five kids. Derek's been putting them out there, man. He's, <laughs> so I think he's enjoying being. Uh, hell, they might end up getting some scholarships sometime soon. I think the boys getting pretty. Uh, they're getting pretty big, but yeah, I think he's enjoying just being dad and like uh, working with the community right now. So I don't know if he's gonna get into the assistant role, but maybe you know, maybe he he wants to be an analyst or something. Maybe he'll get into that. But from what I gather, I don't think so. Not yet. All right, I'm gonna go back to we were talking about Jaden Blue earlier. And I want to get your thought on this comment because I this is uh, from Sue Plexus. Um, and get both of y'all's thoughts on this because I think he's right. Jaden Blue takes good lines. Hmm. Does that make sense to you? He's smart with his angles with angles. running. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's mostly football, right? It's just, you know, one of the things about football speed, people talk about football speed all the time, hard to quantify. You, you know, you can try to diagnose it, but there's a lot of different variables and a lot of different things that determine football speed. One of them is angles. Some guys are better at taking angles. Some guys are better at, like you said, that, you know, being able to have the right running angle to the football and adjusting their angle while running. That's also big, right? Once you acknowledge defenders and the angle they're taking to you, you got to adjust your angle. And I think some some guys are just naturally better at that. They they really are. And uh, as defenders, we literally we have drills where we work on angles to the football and pursuit angles to the football. So I'm with you. I I, I totally agree with that. And on top of that, he's fast. So now you're saying he has a built-in advantage of being able to diagnose angles really well, and he's one of the fastest guys on the team, if not one of the fastest, he's one of the fastest running backs in the country. Real Analytics said he was the fastest ball carrying running back in the country last last season. And honestly, sometimes I don't doubt it. And I think that's what Sark, you had, you talked about it, um, you know, earlier when we talked about it, Bobby, you talked about the speed element and how deliberate it seems to be. And Jaden Blue's a part of it. When they had that injury to Jonathan Brooks, as CJ mentioned, they started to dive into the pony package a little bit and start playing. You know, they were like, hey, man, I don't know if there's a big difference between all these running backs. Let's just try to put them all out there. And then you saw some of that pony package and it, oh, it worked. It worked wonderfully. And I think they should use more of it. With a guy like C.J. Baxter. Now, they liked it with a Keelan Robinson out there, too. But I think now you're going to have running backs who have versatile skill sets. You can use that, too. That may be something we see instead of so much 12 personnel. He may be supplementing maybe some pony, maybe supplementing some four wide receiver package, some 10 personnel like he did at Alabama. That's also when Sark's offenses are at their best, in my opinion. And Sark doesn't necessarily like it, but when Sark's offenses have variety uh, and personnel and formations, they're at their best. His pony package is easily the most effective, most explosive personnel package that he has. That's the two tailback set. Um, I think this year, if you run out there 10 personnel, four wide receivers with Jaden Blue in the backfield, good Lord. I mean, I, most most defensive corners are kind of, it's called a timeout. They're like, man, we're about to get torched out here. Somebody is going to be matched up against some speed, and they just, they're just they not going to be able to handle it. I think he should, the 6-0 line package, I think you should be, if I'm sorry, I think he should be a little bit more diverse in his personnel groupings. you got the personnel to do it. You definitely have it now if you're adding in Amari Nyblack, too. Jeez. Yeah. Man, it just uh, got a lot of it. Uh, hey, guys, uh, here's one from uh, uh, Dante Payne. Uh, does Jonte Cook have a chance of playing next year with all of the elite talent transferring in? I think he's penciled in to play. Yeah. That's, that's what I think. Um, <laughs> now, it's not in ink. I don't know that Sark ever does anything in ink. Uh, but I, I think he's penciled in to play right now. And I think that uh, he's, you know, Jante is extremely talented. And of the young receivers from last year, he was clearly the most ready to get playing time. And he's the one that did get playing time. I think that you're going to see Sark try to lean on him again this spring and uh, see what he can bring to the table. I, I, you know, Rod has talked about a circle of trust on offense or especially at the receiver position. I think I think Sark is willing to have a larger circle of trust. We've talked about this than what he's had last year. I just think it was such a big chasm between having three seniors or two seniors and or one senior and two draft eligible juniors. Yeah. And what he had behind him than ever before. That was a big, big birth or big chasm. Now he's bringing Jonte Cook's a, a sophomore. 
And you've got all these other guys that are going to be juniors, seniors. They're a little bit closer together in ability and perhaps reliability as well. Um, I, I think that Cook is is entering to that, entering in that, and is going to be one of those guys. I just I don't see it any other way. Hey, uh, CJ, I, I did have a question for you. Um, you mentioned this this morning that I want, and I wanted to get Rod's take on it. You said, according to Pro Football Focus or one of those uh, data analytics groups that you listen to and and look into, Anar- Amari Nyblack's average target was 16 yards down the field this year yeah i want to get rod's take on that i mean give it give give rod the num rod the numbers and re-explain it to people that haven't heard this and see what rod's take is on that yeah alabama used amari nye black down the field more so than any other tight end in the entire country uh his his average distance of target down the field was 16.8 yards that was the highest in the country for a tight end by five full yards. So second place was 11.8. Texas used Jatavian Sanders at an average distance down the field around 9.8. That was good for 11th in the entire country. That's seven full yards behind where Alabama was using Amari Nyblack. I actually tweeted out a little side-by-side clip comparison earlier today about Jatavian Sanders and Amari Nyblack running uh, that over-crossing route, that rising crossing route, uh, from a from a nub set, so a nub set's obviously that that inline mm-hmm. tight end or inline tight end or uh, you know kind of close yeah. slot tight end right at the end of the line of scrimmage. He's the last person on that side of the football, and they both run the rising crossing route to perfection. Quarterbacks find them. It's the exact same route from the end zone view. I think that's what you'll see a lot of from uh, Amari Nyblack in this Texas offense next year, specifically because that's. Basically, all he did in that Alabama offense, they found the way to get him balls down the field. There's a lot of corner routes, a lot of seam routes. We obviously know that's one of Quinn Ewers' favorite throws the tight ends is up the seam. And so I I think that brings an an extra element to the Texas offense that you know you're going to have a deep threat here to worry about at the tight end position when you talk about mismatches with speed and uh, versatility uh, against linebackers and safeties. Obviously, at 6'4", it certainly helps. Uh, the size advantage as well. So I, I thought that was really interesting, but five full yeah. yards of, of, of target or distance down the field more than second place in the entire country. That's what great. Do you, what do you think of that, Rod? Wow. That's awesome stuff, CJ. Um, it's mind blowing. It really is. Uh, and I knew that Alabama's offense is a vertical offense. They love throwing the ball deep downfield. We talked about how much Washington threw it deep downfield. Washington was better at it, but Alabama threw the ball downfield vertically, 20 yards or more downfield, more than Washington did. So they loved them deep shots. It's one of Jalen Milrow's, uh, like his strengths in his game. But I did not real, realize I'm right now black. I remember the play he had against Texas, so I know how athletic he is. And that was a downfield shot uh, mm-hmm. as well. Um, so I did not realize, though, consistently they were targeting him downfield that much. That is a That understands why Sark jumped on it. I mean, if you got a vertical threat like that at tight end, so if you can take the top off a of defense at tight end, and now you're doing it at wide receiver. I mean, there is no ceiling. Yeah. There is no, <laughs> there is no top. I mean, that's uh, obviously we can get into the, the figurative and the literal, but they, there ain't gonna be no top of that defense, man. They're gonna have to have two deep guys all the time, and that is the key to splitting those two deep safeties that are gonna have up that seam, as CJ mentioned, is gonna be nine black. So in addition to having that, you're gonna drop that linebacker too. In addition to dropping your two safeties to, to defend the speed. Keep the umbrella on the top of the defense. I mean, on top of the offense, you're gonna also have to have a linebacker dropping deep to protect the seam. Oh man, all you need is one guy coming underneath, and that's gonna be money every time. So I could, I could, or oh, Jaden Blue out yeah. in the flat. That, that's what I'm running really at. I, I mean, mean <laughs> too easy stuff. I mean, it's, like, yeah, you know, if Quinn can just be a greater, a better distributor, even better distributor this year, man, that's. That's going to be as much as anything. It really is. All right. Hey, I, I want to switch to recruiting real quick. Uh, and uh, there's a lot of discussion out there. RL from Chatsville. Auburn's quarterback room is not in the same class as ours. This is in reference to Ryan Williams, the, the wide receiver out of Sarah Land, Sarah, Sarah Land Alabama, hmm. uh, high school teammate of KJ Lacey. Uh, he is expected to make a decision in the coming weeks. He's the only remaining guy. Uh, in the class of 2024 that Texas is really recruiting right now. 
And I say that and why it's important is because uh, he actually has an official visit coming up this weekend. Not not this weekend, excuse me, the following weekend, the 27th, not the 20th. Um, and so uh, I, I mentioned that, but I also want to talk about Auburn's quarterback room as a whole right now, because one of the things Texas wants to do in this process is hold on to KJ Lacey, mm. young man that's going to be a, a junior at uh, uh, at uh, uh, Sarah Land High School in Mobile, Alabama area. Well, Auburn is thought to be the team that has the best chance of prying him away from Texas. Well, something happened earlier today or earlier yesterday that could impact that. Uh, one of the nation's best quarterbacks for the 2026 class, which is the same class as KJ Lacey, uh, is a young man named Julian Lewis out of uh, mm -hmm. out of uh, California. He's currently committed to USC, but I am told that he is also now looking at Georgia and Auburn as well as USC. Um, and Auburn and Georgia are thought to be uh, that group, as well as this fact: he's reclassifying to 2025. And so if Auburn were to, to domino with Julian Lewis rather than K.J. Lacey, that that puts Texas back in an even firmer spot with with K.J. Lacey. Um, I mentioned all of this, C.J., to ask you, you know, your read on this situation. And we're talking a year and a half out. So it's kind of hard to kind of gauge. But that does put Auburn on the spot more. Are they going to go all in on Julian Lewis or go all in on K.J. Lacey? And KJ Lacey's going to see which way that goes, right? Yeah, definitely. <clears throat> It'll also be interesting to see. You know, we talked about Julian saying at the beginning of the uh, of the live stream, his portal entry has been linked to Ohio State and USC. Obviously, USC is where uh, you know uh, Lewis is committed at the moment. If that move, you know, starts the domino effect there, things could be expedited just a little bit. I know Auburn is very high on their 2024 quarterback signee, Walker White, out of Arkansas as well. That's something that uh, they're com they're comfortable with. But obviously when you see a five-star caliber guy like Lewis or saying open back up, it jumps to the front of the line. Uh, and it certainly helps you know muddy the waters from Auburn's perspective in terms of their pursuit of K.J. Lacey, which certainly helps Texas's class hold on to him, they're, they're, everything along the lines of that. I think for Texas, it's imperative that they hold on to K.J. Lacey. He's a guy that will be a leader in the 2025 class when it comes to recruiting. He was someone that was bummed out that he wasn't able to make it to Austin for a third straight week this weekend for the big junior day. So he's wanting to build a good, strong class around him. He likes Steve Sarkeesian. He likes what Texas has to offer here. Holding on to him would be big. And for Auburn, it's a full-on fledged approach to finding that next quarterback. You can argue since Cam Newton, only Nick Marshall has been, you know, a plus quarterback for Auburn in the last 10 years. It's really been a struggle for them to find that guy at that position. And I know Hugh Freeze is stocking up on wide receivers right now. They have two five stars in the 2024 class. They're obviously still after Ryan Williams as well. For them to find that one guy that they can trust and lead that team, it's going to set you know, almost an avalanche off in Auburn in terms of what they can potentially reach offensively. So finding that quarterback, whether it be Lewis, Saiyan, White, whoever it is, is going to be huge for that Auburn program. And for Texas' sake, hopefully it's not K.J. Lacey. <laughs> there you go. All right, hey, uh, let's stay on the topic of recruiting, but let's stick to the portal part of the recruiting process. Uh, Rod, I want to get your take on this. Bobby, Sark isn't letting DBs be a weakness. Uh, Texas not only gets Andrew Makuba through the portal from Clemson, mm -hmm. but the Longhorns are at it right now for Jabbar Muhammad out of the yep. University of Washington. Um, adding that, plus Jade Barron comes back, uh, Terrence Brooks, Malik Muhammad uh, still on the squad, Derek Williams, Michael Taff, Jelani McDonald and Warren Roberson, two young guys that the, the Horns seem to like a lot. Um, is, is this is, – is, is Jabbar Muhammad – Texas flexing a little bit, in your opinion? I mean, it, it, he seems, and I say this, it seems like a uh, gratuitous almost. Like they could have gotten through the year without a Jabbar Muhammad, but gee, if you can get him, why wouldn't you? I mean, what do you think on that? It's a luxury. I agree with you, but you know, I, I, I think these corners of Texas are going to be really good. I think Malik Muhammad's going to be pretty good. I like Terrence Brooks a lot, um, but they got picked on versus Washington. 
Uh, the corners got picked on. I thought it would be the safeties that got picked. The safeties got picked on all year long. Here in the bowl game, Washington got bold and decided, now nah, we're going to pick on your corners. And they did. They went out to Texas corners a little bit. And I think that this is Sark and the defensive staff deciding, all right, you know what? If we believe our secondary is going to be a strength, let's double down on it. Let's double down on it it's, if it's going to be a strength for us. And let's kind of construct this thing almost from the outside in. Well, last year you're – Front seven was your strength this year. If you get Jabbar Muhammad, I think your secondary goes from being a liability and a weakness and being a strength in one off season. I mean, I that I don't know that, that's rare. That's definitely a transfer portal thing to to be have the ability to be able to do that. And with Jabbar Muhammad, I mean, he would step in as one of your best cover guys, if not your best cover guy, along with Malik Muhammad. Those would be your two top cover guys. And Terrence Brooks, I if that if I if if I'm the defense coordinator and we get Jabbar Muhammad, I would have I would have the luxury of cross training some guys, and I would and I would start doing it. Listen, you know McCuba can play any position in secondary. He can play corner, play safety, play nickel. For next season, I would start looking at since today Barron is gonna leave next season. I'd start cross training a guy like Terrence Brooks to play nickel if you need him to. Um, I, and that's a guy that can play any position in secondary too. I was told that by his dad when I talked to his dad. I read a quote from him when he was committed to Ohio State, where he said Ohio State recruited me to play every position in secondary, not just corner. Um, and you know, Derek Williams is a guy that has has corner coverage ability, so I would start entertaining him playing a little bit of nickel too. And and I, I, I'm not trying to you know say that you should be cross training everybody, but certain players. I would cross train them to give yourself, let's say you're a manufactured depth, but to give yourself more options when you're facing opponents about how to match up. And it would help you because you'll be less rigid on defense. And I've talked about if you're less rigid, you're more malleable, you're more flexible, more versatile. It, it, it makes it tougher on offenses to get indicators, to get clues and hints about what the coverage is, what the pressure package is going to be, where the pressure is coming from, what the front's going to be, because those guys are movable chess pieces that are interchangeable. That's, I think, where they should start going with this thing. And, and I don't think it's a coincidence that Sark is now his new buzzword on defense is versatility, position flex three position player. I think that's intentional. All these stuff we're talking about, the speed on offense, the versatility on defense, this is intentional. I do. I think this is all deliberate. They sat down in a think tank and figured out, well, what are we missing? Like, what's the next step for us? And I think roster construction, these are traits that they're identifying that are going to put them over the top. I love it. Uh, I, I like the idea personally of cross training because it gives you, you know, you, you don't know, you never know who's going to go in the portal these days. And mm -hmm. DBs now are five players on defense. I mean, period. They are five players on defense and every defense known to mankind right now, really. Um, and so the more versatility those guys have, the better off you are from a, uh, you know, a, a, a portal standpoint. You're, you're not as open to, you know, people lead. I mean, it's just a different type of caliber. Plus, it's another way for certain guys to get on the field sooner if yep. they do it. right. Um, and ultimately, um, I think the NFL cares about it a little bit, too. They care about guys that have a high football IQ that can not just play corner, but also if they don't have that four three speed, they can play nickel. They can play say they can do a little bit of different things and, and find a way there that uh, ends up finding a home. I mean, you look at Quandre Diggs. I mean, he played corner, played safety, and played nickel at Texas, yep. and now he's still playing. And what did he, he start off as a nickel, then ended up as safety. Safety, you know, yeah. You know, yep. and so those are those are good things. Uh, let's stick it with the portal. Uh, right now, guys. Uh, uh, Ruben has this question. Are we done in the portal? Uh, and then Jerry King has one seven from the portal going for two, if not more. CJ, I want you to break down Texas. Is it seven in the portal? And I want you to break down where you think Texas is going with what's still out there and maybe what they want to attract in the future. Yeah, well, the big name that's still on the board is Jabbar Muhammad, the former All-Pac-12 cornerback out of Washington, visited Texas on Wednesday uh, for a midweek official visit. He is slated to be in Tuscaloosa today, and he is uh, expected to be in Eugene, Oregon, checking out the Ducks next week as well. So uh, the, the big question mark this morning was whether or not he would make those trips. Texas felt very confident about where they stood with Muhammad following their, uh, their, their time together on campus yesterday. Uh, and dating into Wednesday as well. So 
Will he get to, to Alabama? If he gets to Alabama to see former head coach Kalen DeBoer, you can also expect him to, to head back up to Eugene next week and check out the Ducks. So uh, if that happens, wait for a decision there for Muhammad uh, in probably a week and a half or so. Uh, the other part of things with the portal is where does Texas go and how do they get some help on the defensive line? That's mm. the big question mark right now. Uh, Bobby's mentioned it a few times. We don't believe that there's anybody that's been greenlit from the Texas staff to pursue and, and add to this portal class right now uh, on the defensive line. That's kind of the big question mark and a big waiting game. Uh, my best bet is that Texas will re-enter the market at the defensive line spot in the, in the spring, right around the April 15th, to April 30th window. Uh, whenever you know you, you get a little bit of an idea of following spring football, what the numbers will look like, and as well as you know how far along some of these younger defensive linemen have come. But we certainly are, I, I would say, all in agreement that Texas does need at least one more piece on the defensive line. Uh, that will certainly put a bow on what has been a tremendous portal, uh, you know, approach this this offseason it's been spectacular really it's ridiculous i mean that is, it's just i mean look they're gonna lose eight nine draft picks and they're yeah. probably gonna pick up five or six from the portal you know that that's just ridiculous that's unbelievable you know, just call it call it what it is man if you're a texas fan just pinch yourself a little bit that's that, I mean, yeah. that's what i mean you got the number one receiver in the portal number one tight end in the portal you got wow. 14 and a half sacks you got you got a three year starter from Clemson. You know yeah. you got a kick return. You got the best kick returner in the country. You know you got one of the better punt returners in the. Come on now, like, <laughs> pretty good. I mean, I mean, I'm I'm not just speaking to myself here. No, it's 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 no, it's it's unbelievable because, you know, I, I've said this earlier. This potentially could be the beginning of a steamroll, kind of a landslide of momentum for Texas. Guys, for the last 15 years, you've been able to negatively recruit against Texas, and the pitch was pretty damn simple. You go, if, if somebody if somebody's recruiting a kid that Texas was recruiting, you go into that living room, you say, man, you know that they don't produce NFL draft picks. You know guys go there, they underachieve. Hell, we remember even what Garrett Wilson said. He's like, I can't go there, man. Guys go there, they disappear at that program. That that was you thought you brought that up. Hell, you probably brought the quote in with you. All right, you brought the fact they don't play for championships. All right, they don't win championships. They're the biggest underachiever, arguably, in all of college football right now, considering their resources and their talent. You just bring it was you just keep throwing it out there, and by by the end of the conversation, you and him are laughing about Texas. Like, yeah, I don't know. I'm sorry, I shouldn't even thought about that. Now. You can't say they don't play for championships because they just played for a championship. They were in a college football playoff final four. They won a big 12 championship. So you can't throw that out there. You can't say that, you know, Texas doesn't produce NFL players because they did a good job last year and they're about to produce six or seven this year, uh, at least. So that, that narrative is about to be shattered. And now with the NIL uh, being the law of the land, you know, the BMD shout out to the BMD shout out to all the Texas alumni because they're making it happen. Texas is a leader, you know, if not one of the leaders in the NIL space, period. So Texas can offer you as much as any other schools offer you in terms of market value. If you want to go into the education realm, we can talk that. But academically, UT is <laughs> top notch, right? Other than Stanford, the Stanford and Ivy League schools, you can't get better than foot, football. If you want to combine football or sports and academics, I don't know if you can get better than Texas right now. Michigan, maybe. You know, maybe Ohio State, maybe, you know, somewhere like that. But it ain't, it ain't many schools that can give you what Texas is giving you right now academically. And Austin. And ain't no college town better than Austin except for maybe USC's got L.A. And, I mean, maybe if you like Seattle and why – I mean, it ain't, they're like two or three towns that may be better as a college city, college town than Texas. It's the, the, the day of negative recruiting against Texas. That day is done for now. you got to come up with some new pitch. And there ain't a there ain't a successful one. Like there's not an effective pitch now to negatively recruit against Texas. It's just not like what is it? And that's why the guys are coming in. That's why you know Texas is not having a hard time getting who they want. Is because I, I remember when the narrative was easy. It was an easy narrative to ne negatively recruit against Texas. It was you had like five or six things you could throw out there. Now I can't think of one. I can't. Right, CJ. I, I saw you making a motion there. What, what what were you trying to say there? 
It's the Vince Carter. It's over. That's what it is. <laughs> For those unfamiliar, the Vince Carter slam dunk, it's over. <laughs> Negative days of recruiting taxes. You can't do it anymore. You can't. Okay. Jonathan yeah. McKay, thank you so much for the the uh, super chat there. Appreciate you, buddy. Uh, hey, uh, let's go to another different question here for everybody and see what y'all think uh, and on this one. Todd Lacey, from the 23 class, who do you see stepping up in 24? Vasek, Roberson, Jelani McDonald, Leonga LaFowle, Darian Gallette, hmm. um, Sadir Mitchell, any, uh, any of the offensive linemen? Hmm. C.J. Baxter, There's I'm a lot. Trey Weisner. I mean, I'm throwing some names: DeAndre Moore, Jonte Cook, Jelani McDonald. I, I'm, I'm, I'm. I think Jelani McDonald may be ready uh, to 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 make that next step. They moved him to safety full time. I'm gonna, you know, the one that I'm gonna go with is gonna be that that people aren't talking about enough right now is Darian Gallette. I'll, hmm. I'll put that name out there. I, I'm interesting. I'm interested to see. Because athletically, he's he's as good as just about anybody on campus. I mean, he's that he's that powerful and uh, dynamic of an athlete. The question has always been not whether he is that good of an athlete, but whether or not he's that good of a football player. Mm. And based on what I've heard, he made some strides this year that started to make them think he was going to be that kind of football player. Y'all, y'all have anybody from the 23 class that y'all want to point out? You said Jelani McDonald. You want to take that one, CJ? Yeah, I was, I was going to also go with uh, Leon Galafau. I'm very high on what he brings to the football field. Texas obviously trusted him a lot to play special teams this year. He was intermittently tossed on the defense as well late in games. So uh, I think the Texas staff is high on him, and, I mean, I am as well. I think he has an, uh, a path to starting this football season. Uh, as 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 we go into spring, but Jelani McDonald, the the big thing there is his versatility. I know that there was uh, some in house kind of fighting back and forth between the cornerbacks, the safeties, and the linebacking mm-hmm. room, and in terms of who would get their hands on him full time. We obviously know now he's moved back to safety. He's going to be in that safety room for the spring as well. So uh, that's one that's always exciting because. I, I didn't necessarily know where he would fit. You know, he has kind of that mold that you think he can roll into the the box to be a big uh, linebacker. He has the versatility to play safety. When I saw him in San Antonio at the All American Bowl uh, before he signed and joined on, uh, on campus, he was lining up at cornerback and sticking with the best wide receivers in the entire country. So you see the versatility there. You can throw him anywhere in that back seven and feel like he's going to be you know, in position. He won't be out of place. He's going to be someone that contributes, I think, a lot. Uh, it, it Finding the field might be a little difficult now as a result of the incoming and returning bodies in that room. However, he's got the pieces. That's good. Do you um, have anybody in particular you like out of that group, Rod? Uh, in terms of guys I like, I mean, I do. I, I think Jonte Cook's going to be great. I mean, I, I know we got a lot of receivers coming in. I think he's going to separate, though, amongst that group. I still think he'll be among the top two receivers in production, even with that group coming in. I do. I feel good about him, but um, somebody we haven't talked I'm somebody that needs to step up. I, I hope they will. Uh, is Sadir Mitchell. Um, you need, man, you, you really do need guys to step up in that interior D line room, that D tackle room. We don't know the coach going to be for the D line just yet. I'm sure that'll be settled. I like CJ's theory about the timeline in the NFL um, as an NFL coach as the target for that spot. But Man, just losing Byron Murphy and everything you're hearing now in the pre-draft is that Byron Murphy is just already trending up boards. They said he's going to be drafted higher than Tavondre Sweat, who, right, who was the uh, national award winner. But uh, both of those guys are trending toward being first-round picks. It just shows you the impact of losing guys of that caliber. Um, if you lose those two guys after losing Ojimo and uh, losing Coburn the year before that, I just think, you know, you need you need guys who can perform at a high level, capable, competent. Um, if, and, and you need guys who actually can overachieve there because um, with the D-line being D-line coach being new, whoever that's going to be uh, and the losses, probably the you probably lost more productivity there and you lost more impact players there than you lost on any other position, even with the receiving core. I mean, those two guys, Sweat and Murphy, I don't know if there were two more impactful linemen in the country. And they were side by side. Uh, you're gonna miss that. That's that's gonna be hard to replace. All right, I actually have a 
perfect segue to go into the next question. But first, I want to say thank you to our sponsor each and every Friday live stream uh, in the afternoon brought to you by Andy Ludicky, our friend at MyPerfectFranchise.net. If you're looking to start over in the new year and want to own your own business, franchise opportunities may be the right way for you. If so, you want to take you want to use someone like Andy who can guide you through that process and get you started and going in the right direction. Give him a call. 404-973-9901, 404-973-9901, or if you prefer email, reach out to him at andy at myperfectfranchise.net. Thank you, Andy, uh, for your uh, ongoing support of On Texas Football. Here's that uh, comment I said that I thought was a perfect segue, Rod, uh, from Nathan. Daniel Damn. Jeremiah just released a mock draft with Byron Murphy going number 11. Whoa, number 11 says he's the best DT in the draft, in his opinion. Okay, that's surprising. 11 yeah. that's better than the Jerzon Newton at Illinois, wow. and better than Tavondre Sweat that I've seen. Each of those guys, I mean, he's moving up draft wars like crazy right now, guys. I mean, guys, essentially, if he's drafted 11, he's gonna be one of the top defensive players drafted in this draft. The top six picks or so are gonna be all offense. Quarterbacks yeah, and wide receivers. That's right. All quarterbacks. Right? Yeah. It's gonna be quarterbacks, wide receivers in those first like six picks. And then I'm sure a tackle's gonna be thrown in there somewhere. I mean, he he's trending toward being the first or the second defensive player drafted, potentially, guys. If that if he goes that high. Because who's gonna be the who's gonna be the top defensive player drafted? Maybe verse the get from Florida State. I mean, he could be him. Uh what's the um the UCLA defensive end? He's a really good player. I don't know how how he'll go. I don't know about his measurables, but there aren't a lot of elite defenders that are coming out in this draft. And, I, and I, these, first of all, you're going first round, you're elite. But I'm talking about guys who demand being drafted in the top five, right? Guys who demand being drafted in the top 10. I don't know how many of those guys there are. Man, they got Byron Murphy that high. I know he was trending. I've seen him in the top 20 in some mock drafts now. I haven't seen him that high, but that's, yeah, that's high praise. And Dan yeah. Jeremiah does good work. Jeremiah knows his stuff. Yeah, if, absolutely. If Byron Murphy goes 11, he'll be the highest Texas defensive player taken in the NFL draft since Michael Huff at number seven in 2006. Yeah. Wow. Damn. How about that? Yeah. Wow. That's I mean, crazy. You, going back to our point, you're going to miss them dudes. You know what I mean, right? You're going to – and I think Sweat's probably going to be drafted toward the, the back end of the first round. Dude, when they had – the best D-tackle combo in history of Texas football, in my opinion, is Casey Hampton and Sean Rogers. Casey went in the first round. If I'm not mistaken, um, he was drafted like middle middle to later in the first 19 round. 19 or 20 to the Steelers. Yeah. He yeah. Like, and, then, and then I believe Sean was in the second round. Damn, you're talking about two of two D-tackle drafts in the first round? That's, like I said, guys, we that's unprecedented for Texas. I don't think we've seen that before. Yep. Hey, here's one okay. for you, Rod. This is this is just one for you. Any chance of Rod Babers joining the Longhorn staff as a DB <laughs> analyst? LOL. That's from Jordan Coffee. Uh, hey, if if they if they need me, I will give them a discount. I'm gladly I'll be over there as an analyst, or whatever they need, if I get the call. But uh, I enjoy talking to y'all, man. This is uh this is kind of my dream job right now, just to talk ball, having fun with friends like Bobby and CJ. So I'm having a ball. My my wife would have something to say about it, I'm sure. She might get final say. <laughs> I love it, Rod. Hey, guys, what about this one? We haven't seen this name in a while. J uh, Jamon Tapp is my prediction to jump this year That from sharpshooter. Uh, CJ, what, what are your thoughts there? I mean, given – let's talk about it because, you know, Jamon is sitting behind Ethan Burke and Baron Sorrell. Um, Burke is the same age as Tapp. Then you have Justice Finkley he's behind, but now that's a different story. But then they bring in – um, uh, Trey Moore, okay, who likely is a one-year guy for Texas. And you know, Colin Simmons and Zeno Muzulu coming up the in the young in the pipe pipeline, you know, Colton Vosick out there too. Is this the year that's kind of do or die for for uh for uh Jamon Tapp? I think it has to be. It has to be a year in which you see strides taken during the spring. Otherwise, you talked about the youngsters coming up, the Vosics, the Billy Waltons, Zena, Colin Simmons. That room is getting crowded and it's getting cr uh, crowded quickly. So if you're with talent, with talent. Yes, absolutely. And and I think that's important to, to note because, you know, he's 
kind of in the middle of the pack right now because you have the guys you just mentioned that are returning and obviously adding from the portal as well. So it's, it's a crowded room. You have to see him take those steps to be consistently impactful on the field. I thought there were times this year where when he was on the field, he was disruptive. He was finding ways to be around the football. I thought when you saw Jamon Tapp on the field, more times than not, he was making a play near the football. And I thought that was encouraging, but it has to be at a level of consistency in which you can trust him to be on the field time in and time again, uh, because it's obviously we're going to continue to talk about circle of trust, but anywhere that you play on the defense, if you're not schematically sound and playing the right assignment, it's almost as if you're playing with 10 men. So that's going to be the next step for Jamon Tapp to play consistent, impactful football in which I thought he showed pretty good signs of life uh, this past season when he was on the field. Got it. All right. I'm going to go for the last question for this afternoon's live stream brought to you by myperfectfranchise.net. This one from Douglas Scott. And I saved it so Rod and CJ could argue with one another. Oh, um, I think I think in hope Sark will use four wide receivers a lot and rotate wide receivers a little more, especially against easier teams. Tell me about whether or not you think they're going to go eleven personnel more, ten personnel, twelve personnel. <laughs> Y'all kind of argue the the ins and outs, or is Sark going to defy us all and just be versatile like he always is? Uh, that's you, kind of where I'm at. What do you, who wants to go first? I'll go first. 11 personnel will be 50% of the offense. It always has been for Sark. It always will be. And that's that's actually maintained. Uh, that's been the most consistent personnel grouping for him his three years here. So we know that. The, 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 the actual question is, what's going to be the other 50% pretty much? Is, is it going to be mostly 12 personnel, one back, two tight ends? Are you going to go big 11, big 12? That's with Malik Ogbo, the extra offensive lineman. Are you going to go pony package, which you guys know, my personal favorite? Uh, uh, or are you going to go now with something new? And the something new could be that red package he used at Alabama with the four wide receivers, a 10 personnel package, which is not something Sark likes at all. All right, because Sark loves to tight end. He says tight end, second most important position in his offense behind quarterback. So why would you take one off the field unless you figured your fourth wide receiver at times, matchup based, is better than your second tight end or even your, your best tight end? And I think this actually may be one of those rosters where your fourth wide receiver is better than your starting tight end. And I think that's why you could see that red package from Sark. So I'm going to predict, Black Stradamus will predict, you're going to see it. You're going to see it. He's going to break it out. He's going to break it out this year. And I'm going to predict you're going to see more of the pony package. Like I said, you've been watching Mike McDaniel, and Mike McDaniel loves 21 personnel, two back, one tight end, but he does it with the pony. The pony with Raheem Mostert in the backfield and Devin A. Chain. Speed, baby, speed. He, he's been watching. Hell, I know he should have used it more in the Sugar Bowl. He knows that. Uh, he watched the film. <laughs> so I think you're going to see more versatility from the pony package, more from the red package. I'm not sure about the 6-0 line. I think Sark, he, the reason he's going to go with more uh, spread sets, in my opinion, is because he trusts this O-line that he has now. Four or five stars returning, higher upside. I think you see some 10 personnel. So that's what I, I'll say, yes. And the rotation, if you're going to go that route, you have to expand the rotation. So I'll, I'll agree with the, the person in the chat and say, yes, he expands the rotation too. What about you, CJ? I, I would like to see an expanded rotation in the sense early on you're going to be given an opportunity to play one more of those quote unquote cupcake teams that we talk about. You know, the, I don't want to, you know, knock anybody too much, but Texas does get another one of those non conference kind of games against the G5 or lower that you don't normally get to play in the Big 12. You get Colorado State, ULM, and uh, UTSA this year alongside Michigan to start the season. So you get more of those snaps in which it doesn't necessarily hurt you to throw somebody out there that you don't know a whole lot about at the moment. That's kind of what the SEC has been known for, for those four non-conference games over the, the years. Uh, it, it certainly helps the, the, the schedule, the record, whatever it is. But for that, I think it's very important, important for the development of these guys to get on the field, get game reps and understand where they fit and stand in the Texas side of things. If, if I had to play devil's advocate here, to Rod in the terms of where things would go for Texas in the personnel perspective. Uh, Sarkeesian runs a snap every 24, 25 seconds. That was uh, good for 52nd quickest time per snap this off or this past season. And so I, I think what you want to see for Sarkeesian is getting to the line quickly 
and then kind of seeing where to go with the football from there. We talked about it with Washington, that being one of the strengths that they used offensively is going quick to the line so defenses can't sub, keeping those bodies on the field, and then looking to the sideline to see where the adjustments, where the play call will come from as a result. With Sarkeesian, if you keep the same bodies on the field at a time, it certainly can put – keeps defenses in a bind so that there's not a, a, a match in which they feel most comfortable in uh, in terms of personnel matchups. Uh, when you go to 10 personnel, how often are you going to be running out of a 10 personnel with no you know true H back or tight end at the line of scrimmage? That's something that you tip tendencies in when you go to that formation. Five wide, obviously, you're taking a tight end or a running back off the field. The threat of a run is no longer there. If you keep a running back on, that's great. But then you take away one of your true pass catching approaches or, or weapons out there as well. So I love it. I love the idea of throwing your best pass catchers out there, your best threats on the field. How much of it will we see? I don't know. Rod, I'd lean towards you. We're going to see 11 personnel around 50% of the time regardless. Mm -hmm. Yep. All right. It's you guys are awesome. awesome. You guys are just fountains of knowledge. I appreciate you both, CJ Vogel and Rod Babers. Uh, guys, uh, tomorrow the Longhorns host 100 plus juniors for the Texas's wow. first junior. Not, I shouldn't say juniors. They're going to be juniors, sophomores, and freshmen star athletes uh, on campus tomorrow. Uh, CJ, you and Blake Monroe will be there for On Texas Football. Uh, guys, uh, we'll talk to you again soon. This has been On Texas Football's Friday afternoon live stream brought to you by Andy Ludicky and MyPerfectFranchise.net. Guys, uh, great week so far for the Longhorns. Hope Jamar Muhammad and some other things happen over the weekend. We'll be here for you uh, if there's any news breaking. For CJ and Rod, I uh, really appreciate you and hook them. Hook Have em. a good weekend.